Time to get into the Big 12. Uh, of course, staying live here. Uh, this Big 12 that I think will be very good this upcoming season. Uh, obviously, Chris Beard travels to Texas uh, from Texas Tech, uh, takes the road down there. Uh, Texas is certainly going to be loaded. Kansas is going to be much better. Uh, Baylor's coming off a national championship. Those are three very good teams. Uh, the depth of this league is crazy in Iowa State. Uh, they're the 10th, they're not bad. The 10th best team in the league. Uh, they're, they're not terrible, uh, but, I mean, I think they're pretty clearly at least 10th for us. Yeah, uh, just kicking it off, I guess, with Kansas. You know, last year wasn't their best year, and it was clear what the glaring issue was. They just didn't have a point guard. Marcus Garrett just isn't that guy. He's not able to go score easily, and that was a big problem for Kansas last year. He wasn't a guy that late in games can go get a bucket. That just wasn't who he was, but he was an awesome defender, so he brought that to the table. But when you look at Kansas this year, you return Ochai Abaji, lights out shooter from deep. I thought he was going to keep his name in the draft. I didn't think he was going to be back. David McCormick, he really improved throughout the year. He has a soft touch from the mid-range area. He has a nice kind of hook shot that he used a little too much at times, and he can finish inside. He's not Udoka as a book. He's a little more versatile, but he's not as not as good inside. And David McCormick was one of the best free throw shooters in the conference last year. I feel like that's a very underrated aspect of his game. Christian Brown's a guy who can shoot the ball. And then you add two point guards that love scoring. Remy Martin, who had 19 points per game each of the last two seasons at Arizona State. Obviously a much different system than what Kansas runs. And then Joe Yesifu, who really burst onto the scene when Roman Penn got injured at Drake last season. He has experience in the NCAA tournament. I don't see those two playing together really ever. But Remy Martin, if he can show that he can be, you know, not a guy that has to have the ball all the time and take all the shots. He doesn't have to lead the team in scoring. But if he could be a 13, 14, 15 point per game guy with five or six assists, he can be an All-American. But we have to see that first before I fully buy in. But there's no question about the talent on this Kansas team. They are completely loaded. Yeah, and just kind of like going through uh, our ranking system, I had Kansas at one, you had Texas at one. Uh, so we do it based on ties that the team who finished higher in the previous year standings uh, ends up getting the nod. So uh, I obviously with Kansas, I think they have two, like two or three big 12 player of the year type of contenders. You obviously uh, have McCormick who uh, is very solid inside, just a really good kind of low post uh, score uh, can hit shoot a jumper. Uh, probably shouldn't shoot too many jumpers uh, because he's just really good at scoring inside. But if he's uh, open he's, from 15, shoot it. But if you're open from three, don't do that. Yeah. Hey, if, if you're open for three, I, there's worse shots. Open three I guess, is not yeah. bad. Did he make a three last year? I feel like he did. I feel like he made I th- one. Against, I like, think Oklahoma. he went like one for one. Yeah, I think he made one against Oklahoma for seven. I'm, that's probably wrong, but I feel like he did. Yeah, it's something like that. But uh, if you can make like 30% of them, maybe shoot them. But uh, he's also someone that can probably shoot if he, you know, shoots efficiently over 60% from in the paint. So I think that's probably a better shot for him. Uh, Jalen Wilson, I think, has a lot of NBA talent at the four. Uh, He's someone that, you know, has a good shot, uh, kind of tough, gritty uh, struggled. I, I think when you saw Kansas playing their best, it was when Jalen Wilson was playing his best basketball. He struggled in that January stretch where they lost like five of seven or something like that and fell out of the top 25. But uh, he was good early in the season, good late in the season. I think he, he he's going to continue to be a big key. You obviously have Christian Brown, Ochai Baji, who will play like the two and the three uh Brown, I think, needs to work on consistency because we've seen in games last year that he would go off for like five of seven from three and then he'd go 0 of seven for three. So need more consistency there. But uh, Baji solid. And then, of course, Remy Martin, I think a kind of much needed addition, whether it was Remy Martin, Marcus Carr, like they need someone who just at the point could go out and get bucket. And that's kind of the missing piece you see with this team. Last year, you did, you know, I don't know if Abaji's necessarily that guy. Uh, Brown, I don't think that guy. Jalen Wilson wasn't quite that guy. I mean, McCormick, you 
you you're relying upon a point guard to get the ball inside to him to get a bucket. So I think getting Remy Martin, if he plays within himself, doesn't try to do too much. I think that will be a very big pickup, but uh, yeah, certainly Kansas could be another national championship contender. uh, And at least my favorite to win the big 12. Yeah, they're second for me. I have Texas first, but also uh, Jalen Wilson. Like, I don't know why I didn't mention him. He's really fun to watch. He can make plays at six foot eight, which is really good. Uh, he can shoot the ball from deep. He can defend. He just does a lot of different things. And, of course, you can't forget about 19th grader Jalen Coleman Lands uh, getting ready for his age 25 season. He, he's ready. I mean, he shot really good for Iowa State last year. Got to give him credit. I mean, I don't know how much he's going to play, but he should be in the NCAA tournament this season for the first time in seven seasons. So. Yeah, about time he gets there. Yeah. Cam Martin from the D2 level also, uh, forward with size that can shoot, so he could be able to come off the bench and knock down a couple threes. So that's another guy that they added in this offseason. Yeah, and then they get, like, Zach Clemens and K.J. Adams as, like, long-term pieces as well. Uh, mm-hmm. Dewan Harris, I think, will be good as a backup point guard as well. Yeah, he, he's a really smooth playmaker. He defends. Yeah. Uh, his shot isn't really there. It doesn't look great coming out of the hand. I don't think that his percentage was that bad at the end of the season. It was like three for seven, I feel like. But it, coming out of the hand, it just doesn't look great. And he didn't look super comfortable shooting. And he got left open when he was in the game because they knew he didn't want to shoot the ball. But if he could develop that aspect of his game, he could be a really good role player down the line. And he could be a guy that plays 10 to 15 minutes a game just making some plays down the stretch. I could see him being a solid player for sure. Yeah. And – I, I, I'd i be interested to see, like, maybe they run him at the point and have, like, Remy Martin playing off the ball. Uh, you could maybe do that some minutes. But, I mean, there's there's a lot to work with with Kansas. They're going to be uh, really good, probably 14-4, 15-3 in Big 12 play, win the league, or at least finish second in it in uh, typical kind of Kansas fashion. Yeah, and, you know, Remy Martin, like I said, he's probably the key to anything Kansas is going to do because he can go get a bucket for sure, but he can also shoot it from, like, 32 feet and just miss. Like, he he does that a lot. He'll take a lot of pull-up threes, but I don't think he needs to do that this much uh, with the roster Kansas has. They have so many good pieces around him, guys that are going to play in the NBA. I think he could take more of a reserved uh, pass-first, facilitate-first kind of role this season. Absolutely. Uh Let's get into Texas. Uh, they're tied for first in our uh, ranking. So, I mean, Texas, uh, obviously getting Chris Beard, we knew was going to be big. Uh, we didn't think it would be this fast before he you – know, I think we were kind of thinking maybe one, two years, let him get a recruiting class. He's like, screw getting recruits. I'm just going to take all the good transfers in the transfer portal. Uh, gets Marcus Carr to come in. Uh, he'll – kind of run the show probably at the point you still have Courtney Ramey and Drew Jones. Uh, I don't know how you're going to put all three of them in the game. They have Timmy Allen, uh, D- Dylan DeSue coming in. Trey Mitchell is obviously good at UMass. Devin Askew is kind of a by low player. Uh, Christian Bishop is, uh, he's good at high energy guy. The high energy guy. Um, I don't know how he's going to – like, there's too much depth almost with this team. It's Mm -hmm. kind of ridiculous the amount of depth they have. But, I mean, Chris Beard has more than enough tools to work with. Yeah, there's going to be players that have to gravitate towards their role and just take smaller roles. I mean, Christian Bishop, he started each of the last two seasons at Creighton. This year, he's probably not going to start for Texas. If he starts more than, like, two games, I'd be surprised. I just don't think he's going to start – Because you have a three-guard lineup, you can go out there and start from day one with Marcus Carr, who is very underrated. Like, you know, I'm usually in the camp of, you know, if you're super inefficient, then, you know, most times you're not that good. Marcus Carr is different, though. Like, he can go get a bucket. Just Minnesota sucked the last two years. So that was a big reason why he wasn't that efficient. His team was terrible. I mean, last year, Gabe Kalsher shot, like, 21% from deep, and he was hurt at times. Liam Robbins was hurt, and he was the only other good player around him. There's just a lot of nothing going on uh, with Minnesota last season besides Marcus Carr and that led to him not being so great but you look at this roster you have Carr you have Ramey you have Andrew Jones all starting from day one more than likely then you can go Dylan Deesu who led the SEC in rebounding at the four 
And then you can go with Trey Mitchell at the five, who was a very good player for UMass. He has good size, uh, runs the floor well, can shoot the ball from deep very well. He's just a really good player that will be good at this level. He's going to be in the NBA one day in my mind for sure. And then you have Christian Bishop off the bench to play like 15 to 20 minutes. High energy guy. Can go up and throw down a lob. He run. He's really fast. He can run the floor well. He's like. He's pretty much like a wing that plays the four slash five. Not much of a shooter, but he just plays really hard. And then another guy that plays hard is Brock Cunningham. He might not score more than like two points a game next season, but he's going to carve out you know twelve to sixteen minutes a game just because of how hard he plays and how good his defense is. He's going to be a guy that plays minutes even though he's not going to score. Timmy Allen, he's on the floor. He's going to score. But a lot of these guys don't have to be the main scorers. Like, they have a lot of guys that are used to being the number one scorer on their team, but now they can take a more reserved role. Marcus Carr could be the guy that's going to go get a shot late in the game. It doesn't always have to be Trey Mitchell and Timmy Allen. They can they can all just kind of take what the defense gives them. And there's going to be a lot of mouths to feed in this offense for sure, but at the same time, that means that the defense is going to have to game plan for a lot of different players. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, defenses will have their hands full because if you're like, I'm going to take away my Marcus Carr, well, then uh, Courtney Ramey, Dylan Disu, Trey Mitchell, like you name it, they have players to certainly uh, you know, score offensively. I think the key is going to be, uh, obviously, Marcus Carr, you, you mentioned with Minnesota, at, early in the season, his shooting percentages were really you know efficient and it was why he was playing at like, you know, in December, people were talking about him being a first team all American. Uh, just so happened that the rest of the team after the Brandon Johnson, big shooting out (laughs) on Christmas day. Yeah. It was, that was one of the wildest things I've ever seen. That was the last time any, uh, Minnesota player made a single three. So that was the last time Brandon Johnson made a shot. I'm pretty sure. Like, I don't think I saw him make another three the rest of the season. Yeah. Uh, So, I mean, Marcus Carr just had to do too much at Minnesota. And uh, now that he's at Texas, he won't have to do quite as much because he has plenty of talent. And uh, I think the the key thing is going to be kind of like getting players to like their roles. Like if you're Christian Bishop, you're going to have to accept you're going to play 10 to 15 minutes coming off the bench. If you're Timmy Allen, like maybe you start, maybe you don't. Uh, But I mean, you're going to have to accept whatever role you are, and you're going to have to accept that you're probably not going to play more than 25 minutes a game, and, and that's you got to be okay with that. I, I think if, if that's a certainly a big key for uh, Texas, it's going to be about the players buying into uh, what they do, and I I would say like I think they'll lose a couple games early in the season just because it takes time to kind of build chemistry, but late in the season, I think Chris Beard will have this team rolling. Uh, and I think, you know, maybe I, what I kind of think is like a possible scenario, like Kansas wins the Big 12 uh, just because like Texas is still kind of figuring things out throughout the regular season. But uh, by Big 12 tournament time, NCAA tournament time, I think Texas could be uh, the team that people are looking from for this league to uh, make the deepest run. So uh, Texas certainly has the talent. It just is going to be about uh kind of combining all the parts and make it work. No, yeah, for sure. I agree with you. There's a lot of pieces on the team, and we're going to have to see it play out on the court. But to me, you have one of the best coaches in college basketball who has a really good staff behind him, and you have potentially the most talented roster in college basketball. So I'm going to buy in on that all day. Texas is my number two team in the country behind Gonzaga. Obviously, it's tough to bet against Gonzaga, but Texas – I'm buying. I'm buying what they have. I think they're a really good team. And also, you can't forget a guy, about a guy like Jalen Tyson, a uh, really highly touted recruit that Chris Beard had at Texas Tech. He recruited him there. He, I think he signed his uh, letter of intent. And then when Beard took the job at Texas, Tyson went with him. So that's another guy who's a very good wing guy who can develop into being a really key player for this Texas team. Absolutely, he's going to be. I think a very good piece. Maybe you know, kind of a limited role this year, but uh, by year two, year three, I mean, he has all uh, some NBA type upside. So yeah, it'll be good to see his development and kind of this team's development as a whole. So they should be once again, uh, pretty good. Texas is back uh, again. Oh yeah. Yeah. They're back. They're back. Um, Baylor. 
I mean, they, they're coming off a national championship, so, I mean, it's it's hard to get back to that level. But, I mean, they're going to be very good. Uh, bring in James Akinjo, who was granted a waiver uh, from Arizona. Bring in Kendall Brown, uh, five-star freshman. Langston Love, I think, was like a four-slash-five-star freshman. Yeah, he was, on, he was on the borderline. I think he was yeah. a four. So four, five, something like that. In the Basically, range. He was top 35. Yeah. yeah. Uh, top 40 recruit. We'll we'll just go there. Uh, Ab Flagler, probably going to step into a starting role. Matthew Meyer is uh, everyone's breakout candidate of the year. Uh, you still have Jonathan Shamua, Chachua, JTT, uh, Flo Thamba. Flo Thamba. Flo Thamba. Let's go. Flo Thamba, Mo Bamba. Uh, Dane Danger will probably He has like a 7-7 seven, seven wingspan. 7-7. Seven, yeah. seven. Like, that's a big wingspan. Yeah, so this this team I have like I have like a five seven wingspan. Yeah, it's gonna it's gonna be a fun uh team. Uh I think kind of clearly the number three team in the Big Twelve, but I mean they they're still I think a top fifteen level team going into next season. Uh, I think they kind of did all they they could to kind of fill the roles. I think you have a pretty good starting five with James Akinjo, Adam Flagler, uh Matthew Meyer, Kendall Brown, and then I mean, whether it's Shamoa Chachua or Flo Thamba, probably Flo Thamba. Uh, I mean, they're just going to split minutes at the five. And maybe Dane Changa as well. So I think they got a good rotation built. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And, I mean, I think I have them like 12th or 13th. I feel like that's going to end up being wrong. I think they're going to end up being like a top seven, top eight team because there's still a lot of talent on this team. You lose Macy Oteague. You lose Davion Mitchell. You lose Jared Butler. You lose Mark Vidal. But at the same time, they still have really good players there. I mean, Matthew Meyer, eight points a game, but on really low volume, he's super efficient. He can He's a really good shot creator for his size, and that's what put him on NBA radar as he tested the waters, but eventually decided to return to Waco. He can shoot the ball. He's athletic. He can, he can defend. I just love Matthew Meyer's game. He could easily be the Bears' leading scorer next season, and I wouldn't be surprised. Adam Flagler, is he going to take a bigger role? I think if Baylor's going to be – a national championship contender again he needs to and he was really good off the bench last year uh, you know Kendall Brown he's going to be a lottery pick probably Langston Love I don't know how much he's going to play probably a solid bench role Dale Bonner coming over from the D2 level he can shoot the ball and in a, in a recruit I really like Jeremy Sochan he, I think he could end up being uh you know a one and done kind of guy we'll see what ends up happening but he has good size he's athletic can play the three and the four and he can shoot the ball uh you know the rankings for international recruits, I believe, is from Germany. So those, uh, they're kind of weird. I don't, I don't think I ever see like an international guy ranked like top twenty. But I think he could easily be like a top twenty player in this class when we look back at it in three, four years. I think he's a really good player that is going to be very valuable to Baylor's team this season. They just have a lot of pieces I like. Dane Danger, like you said, he has a huge seven-seven wingspan. They have a lot of shooting once again, uh, and they have a lot of you know good role players like. Jonathan Chama Chachua, he may never average 12 points a game. He may he may never be in that range, but he's going to do what he does, and he's going to play a solid role when he's in the game. And I think that's going to be uh, big for Baylor. Flo Thamba, he's a good glue guy. They just have a lot of guys that play their roles, and then they have guys who need to take that next step up, like Matthew Meyer and Adam Flagler. If those two guys become all-conference kind of guys, then Baylor's going to be right in the mix for another national title. Yeah, I think that... Best thing about like Shamo Chachua and Flo Thamba is you don't even have to run a play for them. You just like say, okay, we're gonna throw a lob. Like usually, like the point guard or whoever's taking the ball, they'll like do a little point and then they'll throw a lob. But uh, yeah, it's I think those those are kind of two pieces you really need. And then uh, Matthew Meyer, I think, will be huge this season because I mean, you you look at him, you're you can compare his game to Kevin Durant, obviously not as good as the potential best player in the league. He uh, is the best player in the league, yeah. Yeah. I, I think it's like him or Giannis. So, I mean, yeah. It's, I mean, it, that he's not Kevin Durant, but he's, he's no. kind of got that like ability to just like dribble up, pull up, uh, be 6'9 and drill threes in your face, which, uh, I mean, that's, that's all you can. I uh, want Adam Flagler can run the point, play off the ball, probably will play a little bit off the ball. Uh, they get, a, obviously, James Akinjo, who uh, 
will kind of run the show, be the uh, starting point guard for this team. Uh, and then Kendall Brown, who uh, will be like a high athletic uh, wing that can kind of do it all play. I think they'll play Brown and Meyer at like the three and the four. Uh, that will work pretty well. Uh, Flagler and Akinjo at the one and the two. And then obviously uh, the collection of bigs at the five will be good. Uh, then you get, you know, links in love. Uh, come off the bench as like a six man. I think this team is built to have success this year. Uh, I don't think they're a Big Twelve title contender necessarily, but um, I think I think so. I don't if think they'll win. Play this right. Time. I don't think they will either. But I think if things play right, they could be. Okay. Yeah, I can. They have the pieces. Yeah, they have a good team. Mm-hmm. Uh, I I think they're like very clearly better than whether it's Oklahoma State or Texas Tech. Yeah, and, like, after we get to the top three, it's, it's like, a clear top three of Texas, Kansas, and Baylor. And then, like, below that, you have your mix of Texas Tech, Oklahoma State, and Oklahoma, even though you're lower in Oklahoma than I am, and I think most people. But that's kind of the next three, I feel like. Yeah. I My, my thing is I'm not really that low on Oklahoma. I'm higher on – Maybe too high on K State, but I mean we'll I'm I, I'm relatively high on K State, but when you look at the guys on Oklahoma's roster, like that fits what Porter Moser does perfectly. We'll get into Oklahoma, but uh, gonna start with Oklahoma State. Uh, they ended in a, a tie for fourth with Texas Tech. Uh, I guess spoiler alert there, but uh, Oklahoma State they lose Cade Cunningham. Uh, Big loss. Yeah, he's he's the pretty good b- basketball player. So, uh, not not ideal, but you knew that was coming. Uh, Isaac Likely's back. He's uh, going to do everything except shoot. Uh, Avery mm-hmm. Anderson can shoot. Probably going to tip uh, up. They have Rondell Walker, who's a prime breakout candidate. Uh, they add in Bryce Thompson from Kansas, who I think is. Uh, breakout candidate. You have Caleb Boone, M.A. Moncrief, uh, Musa Cisse, Keelan Boone kind of working the interior. This is a pretty solid Oklahoma State team. Yeah, definitely. And one thing about the Oklahoma State team last year and the Oklahoma State team this year, they have they don't have like a true five man. They have a lot of guys that can play the five, but none are true five men. You have M.A. Moncrief. He can play the five. He's not like uh he's not like a true center though. You have the Boons. They can both play the five, but they're not like true centers. So you have a lot of guys that can play the five, but that's not like all they're limited to. Uh and they have Bernard Bernard uh Bernard Kuma, is that how it's pronounced? I believe. Um, Kwama, I think. Okay, it's one of the two. Uh, yeah. But, yeah, you you have him, too. He's another guy that can eat, eat up minutes on the bench. And then you have uh, eat off eat up minutes from the bench. And then you have Rondo Walker, who could be a very good breakout candidate. Good size, athleticism, only 33% from deep last year, but he's a much better shooter than that. And one thing to remember about Oklahoma State, when Cade Cunningham was out with uh, COVID stuff last year, they competed with Baylor. They ended up beating them in the Big 12 champion or Big 12 tournament, but they competed with them in the regular season. So it's not like that they just got completely steamrolled by the Baylor team that ended up winning the national title. They competed with Baylor without Cade Cunningham. Avery Anderson could develop into one of the better players in the conference this year because he's really quick. He can shoot. He's just that kind of guy. When he has a ball in his hands, you know something is about to happen. I like the pieces on this Oklahoma State team for sure. They have a lot of guys that could take that next step. I like both of the Boons. I like M.A. Moncrief, Rondo Walker, uh, Avery Anderson. That's just a lineup I like quite a bit. Uh, Tyreek Smith coming in from Texas Tech. I like Oklahoma State. I'm not like I don't. They're not going to probably be as good as last year. I think they're kind of underrated last year, even though they ended up losing to Oregon State in the round of 32. I, I think they're a clear tournament team. I don't know what their ceiling is. Probably, you know, round of 32, maybe they make the Sweet 16. But I think that they're a team that could definitely make the tournament and win a game. Yeah, I think they're, like, a seeing projection, like, a prime 7 seed. Like, that, they're destined to be a 7 seed. Yeah, like a 7 seed against, like, uh, LSU, um, Arizona State. Yeah. I don't know. Some random 10 seed. Like, that'd be a, a matchup I'd be interested to see. BYU. Same BYU matters. would beat them. 
St. Mary's probably beat them too. Uh, oh, Todd Golden's uh, San Francisco. Don't let it happen because he he'll he'll beat them. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. Todd Golden's ready. Yeah, I I think Avery Anderson. You saw, I think it was the West Virginia game last year when Cade Cunningham went out. Avery Anderson was like, okay, now it's my turn to kind of beat a guy. I think he's going to be someone that takes a big step forward, at least offensively. I think he'll be kind of like that 15, 16 point at night type guy. I think he'll be very consistent. I think you can expect Isaac likely to kind of run the point. Uh, he's kind of, kind of run the point along with Cade last year. He can play uh, like anywhere. You can play yeah. him at the four if you want him to. I mean, he, he can kind of just go anywhere. But one yeah. guy uh, we both forgot point to mention four. is – yeah, one guy we both forgot to mention was Musa Cisse, uh coming in from Memphis. That's a big-time transfer addition. Like, he can block a lot of shots. He's a really good defender. He has a lot of ways to go on the offensive end, but at the very least, you're going to get a guy that plays really hard on the defensive end, and he's going to make the uh, offense really think about taking shots inside because he can swat anything away. If he can just be like uh, Shamua Chachua, like, just don't even run a play for him. Just go up and – dunk balls like that's what he could he could be like a 10 and 7 guy with two blocks like he's a he's a talented player it's just he's more he was a project coming into memphis even though he's a five-star crew just the offense isn't there uh he needs to bulk up a little bit too but i think musa cisse could wind up being a very valuable player and then uh bryce williams also utilizing the extra year of eligibility he's a guy that made some pretty big shots like his percentage from deep wasn't great as the whole oklahoma state team didn't really shoot the ball well but bryce williams has some big games off the bench so i think he could be another solid player yeah but like back to musa cisse you don't necessarily need him to be a scorer like just block shots you're a great defender uh very mobile like get get I think if he can like learn like what learn to play basketball almost a little bit better uh well, that's great advice. Yeah, le- learn how to play basketball. I think he's like when he starts like learning okay, you know, ball handlers going towards the paint, jump towards the rim and he'll throw me a lob. Like I think he's a prime like lob candidate cuz he has like Dane Danger type wingspan. I mean, mm-hmm. he's like seven six eleven with like a seven six wingspan. I think it is. But I mean, just go up and dunk the ball, and then defensively just block shots. Um, I mean, I think he'll be a very if you and this is a perfect like buy low spot for a player. Like if you get Musa Cisse to kind of develop uh, those type of tendencies. I mean you're going to get an excellent player at the five. And then you obviously have Caleb Boone, who uh, is very experienced. I think he's good at – he'll probably play the four and the five with Musa Cisse. Uh, And I think they'll run out likely uh, Anderson and Ronda Walker at the one, two, and three with likely probably run the point. Anderson – I would say probably put him at the two. I think I I want Anderson on the ball as much as possible. Maybe. I because he he can make threes likely can yeah or he hasn't yeah but like when you look at this Oklahoma State team they from last year they have to shoot better the yeah. Kate Cunningham could have averaged like eight assists a game if they simply made shots but they miss a lot of shots like they had wide open looks a lot and they just didn't make them so like you got you got to make them this year yeah uh you got to make them open yeah, shots sure. are uh, kind of important yeah like. Cade Cunningham got robbed of so many assists, it's incredible. Like, he, he had four or five, I think. Could have been eight or nine. Like, it, he could have doubled it. Yeah. I mean, the, the other thing, too, is, like, you have to make outside jumpers or otherwise teams are just going to 2-3 zone you and just mm-hmm. dare you to shoot it. Yeah, and I and they have shooters, too. Like, Rondo Walker can shoot the ball. I think he could be a 40% kind of guy, but he has to show it. So that's going to be a big key for them this season. Yeah. Um, moving on, uh, Texas Tech, who also tied for fourth. Uh, there's a lot of parts here. You got Terrence Shannon back. I didn't necessarily expect that. You have Kevin McCuller, who might or might not run the points. Uh, I, I like him as a player. 
Um, going to be interesting to see what his role is. You have Kevin O'Banner uh, coming in, best pick and pop. Big Kevin man. O'Banner guy. Uh, you have Marcus Santos Silva coming back. You have Bryson Williams uh, coming in from UTEP. You have Malik Wilson, Davion Warren, Sardar Calhoun coming in. Uh, Adonis Aaron, Arms. Adonis Arms, like a lot of uh, kind of up transfers. Um, some of them will be good. Some of them maybe not good. But, I mean, you're just kind of taking chances with up transfers. And uh, overall, I think solid roster. Terrence Shannon needs to be kind of the alpha dog uh, that he – Probably thought he was going to be last year, uh, but end up being Mac McClung. He kind of needs to be that guy this year. Kevin O'Banner, I think, is going to be solid, uh, being a secondary scoring option. And Kevin McCuller can just kind of do it all. And then uh, the rest is uh, going to be interesting to see who else performs. Yeah, and Kevin O'Banner, like, this is a guy that is really good. I mean, he was great at Oral Roberts last year. He spent three years there, and when you look at it, you know, obviously he's really good in the pick-and-pop game. That's probably where he's best, and that could be a problem because Texas Tech doesn't have a clear point guard. Mylique Wilson could end up being that guy. Kevin McCuller could end up being that guy. Clarence Nadalne could end up being that guy. I do like Clarence Nadalne as a breakout player. I think he could wind up being the point guard when we're looking at this in February, but Kevin O'Banner, he has a lightning quick release. Like he can catch the ball and shoot it really well. He's a great catch and shoot guy on the perimeter and he can drive a little bit. He can drive on smaller defenders. I mean, he drove on EJ Liddell a couple of times in the Ohio state game, given Liddell was a little uh, injured with a back issue, but still O'Banner plays super hard. He's good on the glass. He struggles defensively a fair amount, but he is really good on offense. I mean, he's going to be a guy that averages 12 or 13 a game probably, and he's and his efficiency numbers were absurd last year. He shot almost ninety percent from the foul line and a, a high forties from deep. Like that, he was just great last year. There's no question about it. And it's not just because he was at Oral Roberts. He did this against everybody they faced. They played a really tough non-conference schedule. He did the same thing. They played three games in the NCAA tournament, and he was great in two of them. He was all right against Arkansas, but against Florida and Ohio State, he was really good. So I think Kevin O'Banner could be. a Really good player. Bryson Williams coming in from UTEP. That's a guy who's really good in the mid-range game. Uh, He struggled shooting-wise last year, but he's a much better shooter than the 27% he shot last year. Uh, Sardar Calhoun, that's a really underrated transfer addition in my mind. He's a lights-out shooter with awesome during his JUCO days, and I think at Florida State he was just – you know, Florida State plays a ton of guys, and he just wasn't in that rotation too often. Wyatt Wilkes got more minutes than him. I think Calhoun is a guy six foot six, can shoot 42, 43% from deep, and he's going to be a nice 3 and D guy for Mark Adams next season. But the question, of course, like like you, like I said earlier, the point guard, you know who you're going to have at the center? It's going to be Marcus Santos Silva, who's 6'7", but he plays really hard, good on the glass, good inside, soft touch. Uh, he just plays hard, and he's really good at batting the ball back on the offensive glass. Like, you won't get credit for that with an offensive rebound, but he bats the ball back, and it lands in the hands of his team very often. So he's very underrated in that aspect. You know you're going to have him. You know you're going to have uh, Kevin O'Banner and Bryson Williams playing the four a little bit. You know you're going to have Warren and uh, Adonis Arms, Sardar Calhoun, playing the three uh, with some Terrence Shannon mixing at the two and three. He's probably going to play both. Uh, Kevin McCuller. But you, you have to find who your point guard is, and that's going to be the biggest thing for the Texas Tech team. They're going to defend because Mark Adams is a very good defensive coach, but who's going to be the point guard of this team? That'll dictate how far this team goes in March. Yeah, absolutely. And my guess is it would be maybe McCuller and Terrence Shannon. I, th- I, like I, don't, a, I don't know if they're going to play Shannon at the one. No, I, I think it's going to be some combination of McCuller, Nadalne, and uh, Mylik Wilson. I, I think Shannon's best play him off the ball, and he needs to shoot the ball better. I mean, he, he just wasn't a very good shooter again last year. He's a little bit improved, but NBA team, that's why he didn't stay in the NBA draft because NBA teams want to see him shoot the ball better. So he's going to have to do that next year. He he struggled shooting again. He needs to be a 37 38% guy if he's going to legitimately be a first-round pick. He's got all the athleticism in the world. He's one of the best pure athletes in college basketball. But he's got to improve that jump shot. And I think having a good point guard that is going to facilitate is helps that aspect, too, of Terrence Shannon's game. I just think that's the biggest thing. You always have to have a good point guard that can make plays. We need to see who that is for Texas Tech. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, – yeah, the point guard questions are certainly there. I think 
you look at that starting rotation, I really like Marcus Santos Silva, Kevin O'Banner kind of uh, front court. I like Terrence Shan Jr. Uh, I like Kevin McCuller. Like, I like those four players all starting and being very effective pieces. I just, the point guard questions, uh, whether it's Malik Wilson, whether it's uh, Kevin McCuller, uh, maybe they play Sardar Calhoun and have McCuller be the starting point guard. Uh, Clarence Nadole, if he can take a big step forward, I mean, that would be absolutely huge. I mean, there's plenty of options to be the point guard. It's just, you know, who can be that guy? And uh, we don't know, uh, obviously, but, I mean, Tech is Tech. Maybe they know, uh, and, you know, they, they'll eventually have to know who they will throw the ball into as the kind of starting point guard. Uh, but I think there, there's overall just, you know, even if the point guard play is a bit shaky, even if they turn over a little bit, I mean, there's enough talent here. Uh, defensively, they're still going to be, you know, pretty solid. And then offensively, uh, I mean, with Kevin O'Banner, I don't know if, like, I think he – will probably take a step back uh, because he's not being like the pick and pop with Max Aismas. I think that combination was just absolutely deadly. They complemented each other so well. So yeah. like th- that, that's I wish aspect. he would have stayed. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think it would have been fun to see him stay for sure. I mean, yeah. but at the same time, you know, uh, I think this fit for O'Banner is interesting. Like yeah. he goes somewhere where they don't have a true – point guard that's going to make play. Maybe he did that on purpose. Maybe he was like, I want to show I'm more than just a pick and pop guy, which he did show at Earl Roberts. Like, it's not like that's all he could do. That's where he specialized probably, but he had a lot of good catch and shoots, not, not off pick and rolls, just on the perimeter, catch and shoot from the, from the three point line and nailed him. I mean, he has long range. He has a really good stroke. And when he gets fouled, he's making him at the foul line too. Like he may not be the most athletic, but he plays really hard and he can shoot the ball at six foot eight. So I think that's going to play at this level. He's not going to be an all-conference guy, but he's going to be a really good player for Texas Tech. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, Texas Tech could be probably a tournament team. I think at least of my thinking, like the five we've mentioned already, I think are like clear tournament teams. And the next three teams I think are all like right on the bubble. At least, yep. That's how I kind of see it. No, I agree. Um so let's get in. We ended up with a three-way tie uh, for sixth place. Uh, so tie goes to West Virginia, who we both ranked at seven. So uh, West Virginia, they obviously losing Miles McBuckets. That's a big loss. But, I mean, they, st- they still have uh, quite a bit of talent coming in. They still have Sh- Sean McNeil, uh, Taz Sherman. Those are two guys who uh, you can kind of trust to go out and uh, score at a high level. You have Jalen Bridges, Isaiah Cottrell, who I think will play some minutes at the four. Uh, Malik Curry will uh, kind of run the point for this team. You have Kadrian Johnson, who I think will be in for kind of a breakout season. Uh, We've kind of seen with West Virginia, like Taz Sherman, Sean McNeil, just perfect examples. Like That is true. Juco guys who – come into Bob Huggins' system, like, the first year, they're still trying to figure everything out, and then year two, they take off. So I think he'll be in for kind of a breakout season. So I, I like that kind of, like, front seven. You have Polly, Polly Camp, like, South Wilson, Kobe Johnson. Like, you still have rotation pieces. But, I mean, West Virginia, I think they're they're going to be solid uh, and at the very least, like, war, worst comes to worst at NIT team. Yeah, I you know, I think they could be a tournament team and another guy, Damon Kerrigan from FIU, really good shot blocker. So he brings that to the table, a different dynamic there than Polly Cap, who's gonna, you know, play solid minutes off the bench. He's solid inside. Uh and obviously Gabo Saboyan, one of the best defenders in college basketball. But if West Virginia gets to the NCAA tournament, I think Malik Curry's a fine player coming in from Old Dominion. But I think Seth Wilson has to be their starting point guard and I think he has to be a very good player. I think I kind of liken his game to, you know, he's different in certain ways, but he's kind of like Posh Alexander, except he is a better shooter and probably not as good of a finisher inside. But he's listed as 6'1", 215. 
And when you watch him play, he you, he's a big dude. I mean, this is a big dude, and it's pretty. It's all muscle. I mean, this is a really strong guy. He has a really nice jumper from outside, and he's going to defend really hard. West Virginia only pressed nine percent of the time last year, according to a uh, synergy stats. So it's not press Virginia of the Javon Carter days, but maybe they go back to that because they have more of a of a lineup that kind of uh, would work in that scenario. I mean, you, you can go uh, Seth Wilson, who's going to be a really good defender. Taz Sherman can defend a little bit. And then you can go Kadrian Johnson. Uh, you can go Isaiah Cottreller, Jalen Bridges. And then you can go Gabe Osaboyan. That's a really good defensive lineup that I think would work well in the press. But what, last year they pressed when they needed to. I mean, they had a couple of games where they're down against Oklahoma and Oklahoma State, and they pressed and they got back into the game. So they pressed when they needed to last year. I would like to see it a little more, maybe 15%, 20% of the time this year. But I think West Virginia could be a really under-the-radar team. Obviously, Miles McBride and Derek Culver, they were huge. They were West Virginia's two best players. But Taz Sherman, I mean, on any given night, he could have, he could have dropped 20-plus. He was just a very solid difference maker for that West Virginia team. Sean McNeil a really microwave kind of shooter. When he got going, though, he can make any shot that he took. I mean, that's what it looked like. When when he made his first one, it seemed like every other one was going to go in. But when he missed, it was going to be a long night for Sean McNeil. But Bob Huggins is uh, should be a Hall of Fame coach for a reason. There's talent on this team. I like Seth Wilson a lot. I, his three-star, 185th rating in the country doesn't really reflect what his talent level is, in my opinion. And I think West Virginia is going to be a very solid team. This isn't going to be like West Virginia of a few years ago where they just couldn't make a shot. It's going to be a lot different. They're going to be uh, much better. They're going to be more well-rounded, and they're going to be in the mix for a tournament bid this season. Yeah, absolutely. And- I guess one of the big question marks still with this team is, like, inside, I don't know if they can, like, manufacture easy points inside. Like, a lot of the point production you're going to see is shooting-reliant. Like, Sean McNeil, Taz Sherman, uh, whether it's, like, Kobe Johnson, Seth Wilson, like, Malik Curry, I think a lot of those pieces are more perimeter-oriented. And, obviously, you have Jalen Bridges, Isaiah Cottrell, uh, Bridge is certainly kind of perimeter oriented. Uh, so I, I don't know if they have that necessarily interior piece, but uh, at the same point, like if you can, you know, spread it out for, for wide and get hot every, you know, two games. I mean, if you shoot 50% from three and half your big 12 games, I mean, you're going to win nine big 12 games, I guess. So, yeah, I mean, this is a different West Virginia team. There's no question about it. I mean, yeah. there's no Sagaba Kanate. There's no Derek Culver. There's no Oscar Shibway. But they have a lot of guys that are going to fill in at that five spot. Polly Polycap, I think, is their best offensive option. Uh, Gabe Osaboyan doesn't really bring much on that end, but he's such a good defender that he makes up for it. And Damon Kerrigan, again, another great defender. So you have defensive guys, and then you have a clear offensive guy with Polycap. And, I mean, even if you want to go a little different direction, really athletic and five guys on the floor that can shoot – You can go Cottrell at the five. You can go Bridges at the four. Uh, You could go McNeil or Sherman at the three, whichever way you want to do that, and then the other one at the two, and then Seth Wilson or Malik Curry at the one. I like that lineup a lot. When you're looking for some points, that's the lineup you go to. Absolutely. Uh, West Virginia, I think they'll be, uh, we mentioned it, very solid team. Um, Let's get into Oklahoma here, who also tied for sixth place. Um, Porter Moser is now the head coach. Uh, you want to start? Yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll leave this one off because you don't like Oklahoma. So, uh, you know, they they have, they have lost a lot of pieces, no question. Austin Reeves, gone, uh, and he was great last year. Brady Manick, gone to North Carolina. Kirk Weth transferred to Marquette. So they lost a lot of pieces, no question. But this defense is going to be incredibly good. I mean, they might be the best defense in the country next season. Jalen Hill can really defend. He's back. Elijah Harkless can really defend. He's back. Jordan Goldwire, one of the best on-ball defending guards in the country. He's coming in from Duke. Uh, Marvin Johnson, he's a big one-two guard, combo guard from uh, Eastern Illinois. He led them in almost every stat imaginable last season. They were really bad, but Marvin Johnson's a good player. It's going to be good for this team. Uh, The Groves brothers coming in, they're going to be both pretty solid in the offensive end. Tanner Groves obviously torched Kansas for like 35 in the NCAA tournament. I think he's going to be a really good player. He can stretch the floor, 
I think his shooting's going to improve a little bit this season percentage-wise, and he was a big Sky Player of the Year last year. Tanner Groves is a really solid player. Jacob Groves, he's more he's mostly just a shooter, so we'll see what he ends up doing next season, uh, this upcoming season. Umoja Gibson, he's another guy can really shoot the ball from outside. So they have a lot of guys that can shoot. They have guys that can defend. But the defense is going to be what carries this team. And Porter Moser is a defensive head coach. He got guys that he knew were going to defend, and they're going to defend extremely hard. And then you have a guy like Ethan Shagwa coming in from SMU. He can score inside a little bit. He's a solid piece. But, again, the defense is going to be what carries this team, and they have a lot of guys who defend hard. Yeah, I think they kind of have a good one through four, and then they almost – might try to use like Tanner Groves on a Cameron Kretwig role, at least defensively, uh, to where they they kind of like minimize whatever uh, defensive flaws he has. Uh, but I mean, Jalen Hill, I think, is a very good defender at the four. Uh, he's kind of very switchable. I think that unlocks a lot of things. Elijah Harkless is a very good defender. So, I mean, when you have two guys kind of playing the three and the four, I think that will be good. Jordan Goldwire is certainly a good kind of on-ball defender. Uh, he'll defend points. Umoja Gibson will uh, shoot threes. I'll, yeah, he'll he'll be the offense. Uh, he'll be the Umoja Gibson, Tara Grow show offensively. Uh, offensively is kind of like my main concern. I don't necessarily think they're going to necessarily light up. Like if you told me, this ends up being like the worst offense in the Big 12. One, the Big 12 is pretty good. So, I mean. Mm. Iowa State has something to say about that. I'll okay. tell you. We're, we're, we're excluding Iowa State. Get them out. Here. I, I, I think they're a Not top. A I think they're top 60 offense probably at worst in on Ken Palm's uh, rankings when we're looking at this in March. But I think defensively, at worst, they're probably top 10. I mean, I don't see how this is uh, defensive that's going to be worse than top 10 because they have a great defensive-minded head coach paired with a lot of really good defensive players. I mean, these guys all are real, like Jalen Hill, Elijah Harkless. They were Oklahoma's two best defenders last year. Uh, Jordan Goldwire, great defender for Duke, and that's what got him minutes a lot of the time at Duke the past couple seasons. I mean, you look one thing, uh, you look back at that Duke Louisville game from a few years ago with uh, Zion and RJ and Cam Reddish, the huge comeback. Jordan Goldwire came on the floor and made a bunch of defensive plays. That's what he does. He makes defensive plays, and he's going to translate that into uh, to Norman next season. I like what Jordan Goldwire brings to the table. I think their offense, like you said, probably will struggle a little bit, but their defense is going to be so good that they can just win games on that end. Yeah. I mean, they'll have to win a lot of games like 61 to mm-hmm. 55. Yeah, they'll want to play in the 60s probably. Yeah. I mean, I can't imagine they'll want to – They, I don't think they can play in the you know 70s or 80s. They want to keep it in the 50s yeah. or 60s. Yeah. And if they, they can win doing that, I mean, that that's obviously good. It, that, it'll have to be kind of like that low – slow grinded out tempo type of game you're gonna get that every single game with Oklahoma but uh, if they can win games doing that style I mean they can certainly be an NCAA tournament team yeah and like if you look at what a Kansas Oklahoma matchup would look like on paper all right well Ochai Abaji you'll be defended by I don't know uh, Jalen Hill uh Remy Martin you'll be defended by Jordan Goldwire uh who uh who am I missing here so uh, Joseph Yesifu, you probably won't be on the floor together with them, but you'll be defended by Elijah Harkless. Uh, so you can, you'll just throw your best defenders. Obviously, that's how that goes. But like when you look at that matchup, just in perspective, you're gonna have a really good d- defender in Jalen Hill on Ochai Abaji. You're gonna have a really good defender on Remy Martin, whether that's Harkless or Goldwire. And then inside, you know, that's that could be a bit of an issue. I mean, uh, Groves on. Uh, David McCormick wouldn't be ideal. That's certainly a matchup in favor of Kansas. But then you can go with like a Cole Mayween who's coming in from the Juco level. He's a good defender. So you have a few different options you can go that would slide Groves over to the four. Uh, and But overall, you know, you have a lot of different options you can go, and most of them lead to Oklahoma being an elite defensive unit. Yeah. Defensively, I have no questions with Oklahoma. They're going to be uh, definitely a monster. Offensively, is kind of like the – main concern I have, but I mean, if they can defense wins championships, defense wins championships. If, if they can win championships playing defense, I mean, more power to them and they could make the NCAA tournament, maybe be like a sec 
second round team. I think that's Yeah, probably. I think their ceiling yeah, I think their ceiling is like round of thirty two. I don't think they're gonna go yeah. uh, incredibly far because their offense is limited. That's what their yeah. offense won't be great. But I think well, their then, defense like, will round be good two enough. they're gonna play they're probably gonna be like a ten seed or something if they make the NCAA tournament. And round uh, well, two, were, they were an eight seed this year? Yeah. Like I could they see had them being to play. A 10. Yeah, they had the plague and that I mean That didn't end well. No. So if you if you're playing like Gonzaga or uh I mean Alabama, Kentucky, like you're gonna get beat. Just playing. UCLA. Yeah, UCLA. Like it, you play one of those teams, you're probably gonna be defeated, uh playing that kind of defense grinded outside. But who knows, maybe that team decides to go uh, O of 27 from three or something like that. Yeah, this is like a perfect, like, uh, kind of like Ole Miss last year in a lot of ways. I think Ole Miss was like 16th in Ken Palm's defensive efficiency, but they were like 70th in offensive efficiency. They just missed out on the tournament. Had they beaten LSU in the SEC tournament, maybe they're in. Uh, so when you look at that, I kind of I kind of can see I can see comparisons there. They don't have a Devonte Shuler, but they have a, a lot of similar fitting pieces. Like Luis Rodriguez, you, he's comparable to Jalen Hill. Like you have you, you have similar fitting pieces, and I can kind of see that range of efficiency on both ends kind of being where uh, Oklahoma falls. Yeah, uh, should we get into Kansas State, who I am. Apparently I like Kansas State high. too, but I, I like him too. But you know, I, I think I think you're really high on them. I, I think they can be a tournament team for sure. Yeah, I I think they'll be a tournament team. Uh, I'm not that high on them. Like I'm I'm yeah. like maybe they'll be a tournament team. I don't know that I would pencil that in. All right, I'm penciling it right here. Kansas State will be an NCAA tournament team. We'll revisit this, and I, we'll, and I think we'll, they could be. Revisit in March. Uh, hot take of the night. Chicago um, State will be in the tournament. No, they won't. I'm not even gonna lie. Like they might win one game this year. The uh, Ho- hopefully they play a D2 team because they're not gonna beat a D1 team. I'll tell you that. They they could be in. They're still in the WAC, right? Yeah, and they're terrible. The, the WAC tournament. I mean, if they even last that long, I mean, last year they ended the season before, but that was COVID related. So I guess we'll see what happens. Hopefully, no, none of that. Hopefully, so. yeah, hopefully it's a normal season because last year, even though we got to the finish line, it was a complete disaster. Like, yeah. Not great. Major train. But yeah. uh, Kansas State, they were a major train wreck. Uh, they lost to Fort Hayes State. That, and, I didn't know that school existed until they beat them. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, later in the season, though, like they weren't a bad team. Uh, they, they, play, they played Baylor very tough. Uh, they beat Oklahoma. They played Texas. I think they like basically had a game against Texas, and they kind of let it get away. Uh, Want to say they beat? They TCU. did beat Texas. They beat Texas. Hold on, let me let me pull it up. If you see me looking down, I'm looking at my phone to pull up Kansas State schedule real fast. I, they I beat Oklahoma. Like they, I didn't. Didn't they beat Texas? I I feel like they did. I think they lost that game to Texas, but they did lose to Texas. God. Yeah. But but okay, like they, they won four of their or they won yeah four of their last six. So they, they lost to Fort Hayes State by thirteen. Like that that is that's something. Yeah. And uh, that's but, not like some powerhouse D two program. Like they they're not that good. Yeah. So I mean, but they picked it up. They went on the road and beat TCU by eight. Uh, then they beat Oklahoma. Uh, they that's beat a big win. Iowa State, which uh, that's everybody beats Iowa State, so yeah, might as well uh, do it too. And then in the Big Twelve tournament, they beat TCU by twenty-one, and then only lost to national champion Baylor by six points in the Big Twelve you know, tournament. So you know the difference. I and I, I went back and watched. Uh, parts of both of those two games today in preparation for this podcast. They play Nigel Pack off the ball most of the time. That's what they have to do. Play Mike McGurl on the ball all the time and play Pack off the ball. Yeah, Pack yeah. struggled a fair amount when he was on the ball last year. He just he just wasn't ready for it, I guess. I, I don't know. He wasn't great when he ran the point. But when he was off the ball, 
and getting ready to shoot the ball. He was a catch and shoot guy. He was awesome. I mean, he made 11 combined threes in those two big 12 tournament games. If he's that catch and shoot kind of guy who can handle the ball as a secondary guy occasionally, he's a 15 point per guy game potentially. Like he's a really good scorer. Yeah, I think Mike McGurl as well. He's kind of really overall solid at the point. Like he's not going to blow you away. He's not an elite shooter. Uh, he's a pretty good defender. He's a good ball handler. Like I think he's an ideal kind of matchup next to Nigel Pack. And then Pack can just kind of explode offensively. I think that's kind of a good one two option at the point slash two. Uh, they. You know, absolutely won the Mark Smith trade. Oh, yeah. uh, I mean, that that's traded Dijuan. Dij, is it? It's Dijuan Gordon, I think, for Mark Smith. I, I mean, you need more shooting. You take Mark Smith. That that's yeah. that's a good deal for Kansas State. Yeah, and but we see I'm these not, every year. The, the, yeah. I always love the one for ones with him. like they're not officially trades, but they're pretty much trades. Yeah, uh, but I mean, this trade it it very much went in Kansas State's favor. Uh, Mark, Mark Smith, I think, is going to be kind of solid playing like that three and the four. I think Davion Bradford, uh, I, I remember Big watching fan. the Baylor game. He was Big really fan. good in that game. Uh, put Shamoa Shachua and Flo Thamba on skates. Uh, did what Drew, we were expecting Drew Timmy to do in the national okay. championship. Okay, well, well, let's not let's not talk about that. Okay, See, that we're not we're not doing that. That's a little disrespectful. It, that's that's the national player of the year you're talking about. The the preseason national player of the year. I I don't care. He's winning the national player of the year. And yeah. but like Davion Bradford, he struggled. Uh, he doesn't really have any post moves that he can go to. He needs to work on finding some post moves a little bit. But he moves really well for a seven footer that's over two hundred and fifty pounds. Really good uh, when he cuts the basket. Uh, he just has to find some post moves that makes him more dangerous in that area. But he's super strong. I mean, he dunks everything inside. And if that's what he is, he's an eight point per game, five rebound per game guy. Uh, who is really reliable inside, then that's what you'll take. But I, I think there's more in there than uh, what he showed last year as a freshman. And Kansas State, not good last year. We all know that. They, we, yeah. Nobody expected them to be good. But one thing that happened because they weren't good is they had to play true freshmen a lot, which battle-tested them in some tough Big 12 games. Nigel Pack, Selton Miguel, who was really not good last year, and Davion Bradford, who was good at times. No freshman is going to be great. No, no freshman is Zion. That doesn't happen besides Zion. So, you know, that ha- Kevin Durant, maybe like those two happen, yeah. but other freshmen struggle and that, that happens for them. Yeah. Most freshmen struggle for periods of time, but Nigel Pack had some really good games near the end of the season and somewhere in the middle of the season, Davion Bradford was up and down. But the one thing that playing them a ton of minutes did was battle testing them for future years. I nobody thought Kansas State was going to be good, and they weren't good. But their freshman got experience, which is all that really mattered. Yeah, and I think the kind of thing I I liked is that they got better throughout the season. Like it, it's one thing to play your freshman, but just get you know kicked in the butt Destroyed. every single yeah. game, lose by which, thirteen to Fort Hayes State every game. Yeah, which they did early in the season. Uh, they, they lost to Fort Hayes. Yeah, but they got better throughout the season and. I think there's an upward trajectory where I I am at least buying into the Kansas State hype this year. Uh, maybe buying too hard into it. Maybe they only end up being an NIT team. But I think they'll be, at the very least, an NIT team. Uh, is Myel Masood coming in from Wake Forest? Yeah. Good size, 6'8", 2 slash 3, and he can really shoot the ball. That's, that's a good addition. I mean, he's not a guy that's going to go average double figures probably, but can he knock down a couple threes a game? Absolutely. I, I think there's just enough pieces on this team, and if the transfers like Smith and Masood play out the way I think they could and Bradford and Pack take the jumps I think they will, they're a tournament team potentially. But like, yeah. you know, a last four in, playing in Dayton kind of team. So I, I don't think they're going to be a clear tournament team by any means, uh, but I think they have the pieces to make a tournament. Yeah. Hey, if they they make the if they're playing in Dayton, that's st- I still win this uh, pencil. Yeah, that's true. Hey, I hope they make the tournament. I I'm a big Nigel Pack fan, and, and when you look at Pack and Bradford and Selton Miguel, who who hopefully improves this season, uh, he could have less of a role with Smith and Masuda in the picture, but. 
they none of these guys were top 100 recruits. I looked at it earlier. Pack was 124th in the class of 2020. He's going to end up being like a top 30 player in the class. I mean, he had 11 points per game as a freshman, shot 40% from deep. I like Nigel Pack's game a ton. And then uh, Davion Bradford, he was like 200th in the class of 2020. He's going to really outplay that too. I mean, these aren't like five-star McDonald's All-American guys, but they're really good players that played great roles as a freshman. They're only going to improve, hopefully. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Next team up here, it is the TCU Horned Frogs. Um, They're going to be, I think, solid this season. Uh, Mike Miles is very good at this sport called basketball. Bucket getter. Yeah, bucket getter. Bucket getter. He he Uh, made the the U19 team. Yeah. And they tried to kind of, like, have him run the points a little bit in that. But uh, he'll probably try to do a similar thing this year. You have Emmanuel Miller. You have Maxwell Evans. uh, Francisco Farabello. Micah Peavy. Shahada Wells. uh, Jacoby Coles. Damian Baugh. Xavier Cork, uh, a lot of players here. A lot of new faces. Like, this team's yeah. a lot different than it was last year. And last year's team wasn't very good, so, like, that's fine. I mean, R.J. Nemhard, he left, didn't get drafted. He was a lot better last year than he was either his other season at TCU, so that's cool. Uh, he's gone. Uh, Kevin Samuel transferred to Florida Gulf Coast. Uh, Emmanuel Miller, though, he moves. He's like six seven. I think his wingspan's probably like six eleven. He moves really well with the ball in his hands. He just can drive, uh, and he's really good as a four man. That's kind of undersized, but plays a lot bigger. Uh, Xavier Cork was solid for Western Carolina. And then you look at a guy like Shahada Wells coming in from Texas Arlington. His first game of his career, he played really well against Cade Cunningham in Oklahoma State. He's a bucket getter. He scores from anywhere on the floor. He's quick, and he loves shooting the basketball. I think he's going to be a really nice complement to Mike Miles. They're both guys that can go get buckets. Miles is more of a facilitator than Wells is, but both are going to shoot the ball a lot, and both are going to be really good scorers. But what is a guy like Jacoby Coles going to do coming in from Butler? Like, what are some of those additions? Cassius McNeely coming in from Texas A&M. What are some of those additions? Micah Peavy, that's another one. He's a borderline five-star guy, great defender. He needs to improve his offensive game. What's he going to do? So the question is, what are some of those other guys that haven't necessarily proven themselves at the Division One level yet, but TCU is buying the upside? What are they going to look like this season? That's really going to dictate what TCU does. I don't think they're a tournament team, but I think they have a lot of pieces. Yeah, Uh, I think if they, I I still don't think there's an area where I see them necessarily making the tournament, but. I think they'll be like a, an IT level team. Like that's yeah. where I think yeah. them being uh, like Mike Miles, I think is a very good player. Like he, he could be first team, all big 12 level type player. I think he, we know what he's going to do this season. He's going to be uh, very good. Emmanuel Miller coming in from Texas A&M, I think will be solid. Uh, I'm kind of buying a upside play with Micah PB coming in. Uh, you know, Shahada Wells can step in and, play a big role. I mean, they have st- still have Mike Maxwell L- Evans, uh, Sole May Dumbia. Dumbia. Yeah. Dumbia. He's a really, really solid Juco player. Juco, yeah. Juco is a tough spot for true big men. I yeah. mean, they just play really fast. So they're not always involved in the game statistically like you'd think, but Dumbia could be a really good player down the line yeah. for TCU. He could step in and be the starter at the five later yeah. in the season. I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah. I think it, he he's someone I heard someone mention like he could run the be playing the center, uh, which kind of I'm kind of interested to see who they kind of start because you have Mike Mike Miles who will play the one or the two. Uh, you got put Emmanuel Miller maybe he plays the three or the four. Uh, Dubuye could play the five. Micah PB like he can play. You probably want him at the four because he's not a shooter. Yeah. Yeah, this is – it's a really weird roster. They have a lot of weird-fitting pieces, that's for sure. Yeah. They they like they have pieces, but I just don't – like, they have two – they have a lot of point guards, too. Like, Wells can play on and off the ball, so can Miles. But, like, Damian Baugh, what does he really bring – like, he's a good defender, but what else does he really bring to the equation here? Uh, 
and who's the other point guard they added? They added another one, uh, Maxwell Evans. Like, what is what does he bring to the table here? I just don't see that fit really being a thing. I feel like you could have used that scholarship elsewhere. But, you know, I'm curious to see how it plays out. Probably not a tournament team, but I like Mike Miles and Shahada Wells. So Yeah. Yeah, I, I'd say non-tournament team. Jamie Dixon, I think, is underrated as a coach. Like, he's he's not – elite by any means but like he's a solid coach so i think he'll coach this team up to at least be like an an it level uh type of team i I don't think they're gonna drop off dramatically like uh the next team we'll talk about iowa state but uh yeah i I just don't see this team having tournament upside i'd see that being like six and twelve in the big 12 or something like that yeah, no, I, I think upside, they're an NIT team. You know, I, I just don't see NCAA tournament. Yeah. Um, I guess time to move on to Iowa State, who I, I think I've, I'm have i higher on now than I was beginning of the offseason. Now they did add some uh, pieces to kind of help that. But uh, early in the offseason, I was – saying this team's going to be terrible. I think they're they're going to be better than Georgia. They're going to be better than California. That's not saying I, I, much. Yeah, I mean, everybody's better than Cal. I mean, you can Except throw... Chicago like, State. You can throw, like, you and I together with, like, three random people from Twitter, and we'll probably compete with Cal. That's not true, actually. That's, that's very untrue. We'll, but, we'll probably uh, get our butt smoke, but... I mean, yeah, I, we'll, if we'll I'm put playing pick... Effort. Yeah, if I'm playing pickup with random dudes, let me tell you, there's no better character building exercise than getting screamed at by some random dude for being slow. I'm like, I can't control that. I'm sorry. I mean, it's it's not my fault. Yeah, you got you just gotta run faster. I, I wasn't I wasn't gifted in that aspect, and you know, yeah. being five six doesn't always help. But let me tell you, getting screamed at by random dudes playing pickup, very very good character building exercise. I'll yeah. tell you. I, I'm experienced. Yeah, now now you have the thick skin that you need yeah. to <laughs> go play pick up and beat Iowa State. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but you know they have they have good pieces. I mean Isaiah Brockington, he was really solid for Penn State. Gabe Kalsher was really bad shooting last year, but he's a good on ball defender. But that shooting's really gonna have to turn around. The twenty four percent from last year, I really don't think he's that bad of a shooter. I think at worst he's like a thirty two percent guy but I think he's a 36 37 percent kind of guy but Tyrese Hunter top 40 recruit I think this guy is going to be he turned the Iowa State program around he's incredibly fast 6-1 things like 175 he reminds me a lot of Isaiah Miller except he's a better shooter than Miller but he plays really fast he can dunk the ball he's really athletic and he plays really hard on the defensive end he's a better shooter though and probably not as explosive as Isaiah Miller but there's some uh, similarities I could draw there, especially with the size. But I think Hunter is going to be a really good player, could be one of the best freshmen in the conference. Uh, George Condit, can he go back to what he was as a, as a sophomore? He struggled last year. But I like Condit. He can block shots. He's efficient inside. I'd like to see him kind of revert to what he was a few years ago, and I think that's going to be really big for this Iowa State team. Uh, you have Xavier Foster is a seven-footer. He's a sophomore. Uh, Blake Hinson missed last year with uh, undisclosed illness. He came in from Ole Miss. That's an underrated player there because he didn't play last year. So I feel like people kind of forget about him. But this Iowa State team won two games last year against Jackson State and Pine Bluff, I believe. So it's hard to get worse than they were last year. And I think they definitely improved the roster. I mean, you lose Razier Bolton. You lose Jalen coleman Lands, You lose Solomon Young. But overall, I think this team's better. Yeah, it, I mean. That, it, that's it's hard. You can't get worse, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, you can't get worse. Yeah. yeah you Kick it worse, and if Razier Bolton and Jalen Coleman lands are your two best players, you don't have a good team. I'm sorry. No. But, but like, they almost beat Baylor. Like, I feel like yeah. we forget about that. Like, they almost beat Baylor. Uh, yeah. Like, they, I mean, they, they led Baylor they, for, like, 35 minutes. And then choked it away. Well, that's what bad teams do. They, they can't yeah. finish it. They find and ways they, to you, lose. You bring Caleb Grill back who was originally committed to South Dakota State under T.J. Osselberger. Then he ended up at Iowa State under uh, Steve Prohm. Transfers to UNLV under T.J. Osselberger. And now he's at Iowa State again under T.J. Osselberger. So Caleb Grill, back in Ames. Yeah. I, I think a kind of strategy I would use, like play Xavier Foster, play Jane Walker, play Tyrese Hunter, play you know kind of these freshman extended minutes more than – you know, let them make mistakes because this year – 
may as well be a throwaway year. Steve Prohm put your program in such a bad spot that this year should be treated as in a relevant season. Uh, it probably will be for Iowa State, but like we kind of touched on it with Kansas State, like they struggle big time. I don't think his team's going to struggle as big time as Kansas State. They're not going to lose, you know, to Fort Hayes State. Fort Hayes State, yeah. But I, I'd, I'd want to just let these freshmen kind of ride it out, let them make their mistakes early on, and then uh, try to get, you know, because what you're ultimately building for is next season. I know Jose Brockington, Gabe, Gabe Kalsher, if he shoots better than 24% from three, uh, Caleb Grill, Blake Henson, like they can help you win. Uh, Tristan Aruna, I guess, could do I don't the know same. how I missed like, Aruna. Awesome defender. Yeah, it, I mean, they, these type of players can help you at least win games now, but I don't necessarily think that's, you know, in the best interest of uh, TJ Altsaber. I think the key thing is going to be building for next season because next season's going to be that kind of like first year you kind of get judged on everything. I think that's going to be the key season. You want to develop these kind of freshman pieces. Yeah, and like a lineup of uh, Tyrese Hunter, Isaiah Brockington, Gabe Kalsher, Tristan Enaruna, and Xavier Foster or George Condit, like that's not a bad lineup. Like they can win games with that lineup, but you got to let Tyrese Hunter run the offense and let him show why he's going to be the future of this program. Yeah. Absolutely. That, that's kind of where I would go with everything. Um, yeah, so we got through the 10 teams. Let's go into player of the year. Um, you want to start? Um, yeah, I'll go with David McCormick. I think he really impressed last year. He's more dynamic than Yudoka Azabuki. Like I said earlier, just not as strong inside. But he brings a lot to the table. His free throw shooting's awesome. Uh, maybe he'll show a three point shot this year. Who knows? But David McCormick's a guy that could score, you know, 14, 15 points, lead Kansas in scoring. And if they end up winning the conference and he's their leading scorer, he's probably going to win the award. Yeah. I kind of did the same thing, like best player, best team. I, I think there's like three candidates. I think it's. Uh, McCormick, Marcus Carr, and I went with Ochai Abaji. I think he'll kind of try to do a little bit more offensively than he did in the past. Uh, certainly, if you're coming back, you want to build on that NBA upside. I think a lot of it uh, with him will come down to like creating off the dribble. So I think he'll do a little bit more offensively. I think he'll be the player of the year. But, I mean, McCormick, Marcus Carr, like, I think those are – like you could have chosen any one of those three, I'd say, yeah, that's yeah, perfectly reasonable. Uh, I don't necessarily think like Nigel Pack, maybe. Uh, hey, Kansas State won't be good enough. Like it has to yeah. be a top a player from a top five team, probably. Yeah. And then you can think of like T.J. Shannon, Avery Anderson. Like there's other options for sure. Uh, Matthew, Matthew Meyer. Meyer, yeah, Adam Flagler, like the, Kendall Brown. If he's that good, I mean, yeah. we both. We can spoil it now. We both have him as freshman of the year in the conference. Huge spoiler. Okay. But we'll, Kendall, we'll, we'll go to that next. Uh, yeah, but, like, uh, it, it could be Kendall Brown. Like, there's options. Like, Texas. Is it Marcus Carr? I, I think Texas is the best team in the conference, but I don't know who their best player is. Like, is it Marcus Carr? Is it Timmy Allen? Is it Trey Mitchell? Is it Courtney Ramey? Is it Andrew Jones? Like, there's too many options almost. So, it, it's tough to really say. So, you know what? I'm just going to go with David McCormick, but there's not a clear – option here like you can go a bunch of different ways yeah uh i guess freshman of the year kendall brown uh we both have that there um yeah he's gonna be very good he's very athletic player uh i would almost say is more built for the nba than he is college but i mean he's gonna be very good in college and i don't necessarily know that if there's like a necessary contender uh maybe like a Tyrese Hunter or something like that from Iowa State. but I, Iowa State's just probably not going to be good enough. So that's kind of yeah. what it came down to for me. Like, I don't think that's valued as much as it is for player of the year. Like, Tyrese Hunter could be the top scoring freshman, but I don't know if that's going to get him the award. Yeah. And I I don't see a lot of contenders. Yeah, there's not, there's not like crazy high recruits in the Big 12 this year. Yeah. A lot of transfers. A lot of a lot of transfers, a lot of transfers. Yeah, uh, 
But I, I think the best transfer pretty clearly is Marcus Carr. Um, yeah, I think he's a Big 12 Player of the Year type contender. He's going to go out. He's going to you know, put up high-level points per game. Uh, he's probably going to shoot a little bit better uh, now that he has actual good teammates and isn't being double-teamed every uh, possession like he was kind of late in the season for Minnesota. So, yeah, Marcus Carr, newcomer of the year. I think he'll run away with it. I guess Remy Martin could be, like, in the conversation, but uh, I think it'll end up being Carr. Yeah, yeah, there's, a you know, Martin's in the mix. Uh, I think it's Marcus Carr, though, for sure. Yeah, it's his to lose. Yeah, no question. And I don't think he'll lose it. Mm-hmm. Um, coach of the year, uh, I went with Bruce Weber. If I'm going to project Kansas State to finish sixth in the league uh, like I am, I, I got to go with Bruce Weber because everyone's saying Kansas State's going to be basically slightly better Iowa State. And that's not going to be You're saying that. I, mean, no, that's, I don't see that. Yeah, they'll be better. So I'm, Bruce Weber, with the, his sixth place finish, his 9 and 9 in league play, he's going to win Coach of the Year. Yeah, I'm going with Mike Boynton. Just showing the year after Cade Cunningham, you went to your first tournament with Cade Cunningham, but can you do it without him? I think absolutely. I think Mike Boynton will be the coach of the year. Yeah. Uh, I think if Baylor wins the league, maybe Scott Drew wins it. But like, Bearden, I feel like that's never who wins the award, though. Yeah. Like, like if you're projected to be like top two in your conference and you're top two in your conference, like you did what you're expected to do. Yeah, but, like, if Baylor does, like, because Texas and Kansas are, like, clearly one and two. Like, if Baylor wins it, I could see them giving it to Scott Drew. But, I guess, yeah. 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 Uh, Bill Self's out. Uh, Chris Beard is out. Um, Maybe Mark Adams could be in the mix if they finish top three. Yeah. Um, I mean, if, if Iowa State finishes uh, – not last. If they make BNIT, I think we got to give it to TJ Osselberger. If they finish ninth, I think you should give it to TJ Osselberger. And it, I mean, we're, we're not all that high on TCU. So, I mean, maybe they finish better than TCU. Maybe, maybe. It's a possibility. I don't think so, but maybe. Maybe. Um, yeah. Uh, Conference Defensive Player of the Year. I struggle big time with this. Uh, I went with Isaac Likely. He's kind of like a switchable defender, uh, can play some minutes at the four. Uh, I, I had a lot of, like, thoughts about this. Like, I thought maybe Musa Cisse. Uh, I considered, like, all three of the, you know, Goldwire, Jalen Hill. Uh, Harkless. Uh, Harkless, that, that's who I was thinking of. Combination. I thought of Kadrian Johnson as well, uh, but ultimately, yeah, went with Isaac Likely. Yeah, I'm going with Gabe Osaboyan from West Virginia. He's just a really good defender. I mean, statistically and just watching him on tape, you know, this is a guy that really defends, can defend multiple positions, and he's just a great defender. So I think that's going to get Gabe Osaboyan the award. Yeah. I I also considered him, but I, I wasn't going to spoil that for you, so. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, yeah it, defensive player of the year, coach of the year. Uh, there's a lot of uh, choices for that, unlike the other awards. No, yeah, for sure. Um, a- anything else? Uh, we, I guess, had a Twitter question from Mike Week. Uh, is K-State a sleeper, as we've discussed? We've yes. answered that question. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, we, we've answered the question. Uh, sorry we didn't get that. Uh, if you want to you know, get your conference reviewed, leave a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. Uh, we'll, we'll do that. and uh, Maybe we'll live stream it again. We'll have to see. Yeah, we'll, we'll have to see. Uh, but, yeah, make sure to do that. Uh, until next time, thanks again for all the people that tuned in to the live stream. Uh, and... Uh, obviously on the podcast version as well. Say again for tuning in and we'll be back next time.